Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub, and from time to time I have the chance to sit with a guest who's produced a film that's of interest to the Jewish community. And I often think they're good films and ones which many of you would like to see. But every now and then, I am personally taken by a film which I think is so special, so well done, riveting, moving, touching, from beginning to end. And on this edition of L'Chaim, I want to recommend to every one of you the film Azimuth. The story of two soldiers during the Six-Day War. One, we soon learn, is an Egyptian soldier, Rashid, played masterfully by veteran Egyptian actor Sami Sheik, whom some of you may know from the ABC series Lost, or from the Fox series 24. And the other soldier is an Israeli soldier, Mori, also played wonderfully by veteran Israeli actor Yiftach Klein, who plays Ehud Barak in the 2018 film Seven Days in Entebbe, and who starred in the Israeli film Policeman, as well as a number of Israeli TV series. And Azimuth is basically a two-character film about the meeting, a chance encounter in the Sinai Desert that quickly turns into a life and death struggle, a battle between two tired soldiers, each of whom is just trying to get back home to their families. You understand, I can't tell you how the movie resolves, who wins, who loses, how the movie ends. That's the point of the film. But I'll be surprised if there's a dry eye in any movie theater where Azimuth plays, if not chills running through one's body. I actually love this film. Azimuth. I'm driving out here to the studio. I'm listening to the theme song. I'm just weeping, weeping. It's an incredibly insightful, important film. And lucky, lucky me. I also have to love the brilliant individual responsible for the film the first-time film writer, director, co-producer of Azimuth, and the voice heard singing this fabulous song under the film's closing credits, which is no surprise, since singing and acting and performing has been this man's forte for more than 50 years. This is a man I love very much, Mike Burston, star of stage and film and television, who replaced Jim Dale in the leading role of Barnum on Broadway, became the first Israeli star on Broadway in a leading role. He's also the recipient of two Drama Desk nominations as Best Actor, one for his portrayal of Mayor Rothschild in the off-Broadway revival of Sheldon Harnick and Jerry Bach's last musical, The Rothschilds. They, of course, wrote the Broadway classic Fiddler on the Roof. And the other of Mike Burston's Drama Desk nominations was for Best Actor in the Folk Spina revival of On Second Avenue. And if you know anything about Mike Burston's long, distinguished, and multi-talented career, you know he comes out of the Yiddish theater with impeccable Yiddish, the son of the late great Yiddish language actors Pesach Bernstein, and Lillian Lux. And in a story reminiscent of the George M. Cohan families, Mike actually first appeared as a child actor with his twin sister in the family act, The Four Bursteins, 
and in many of his father's productions. Mike Burstein was born in New York City, but he's a devoted Jew, a deeply committed man, committed to the state of Israel, and Mike holds dual citizenship, American and Israeli. And you and I have, lucky me, I've been <laughs> friends with you, it seems like forever. It is fabulous to have you here, but you, Yasha Koach, Kolakavod, Mitsuyan, Mitsuyan, Mitsuyan. Thank you. You did a fabulous film, Azimuth. Even as I mention it, I get chills. So that's where I want to begin. Mazal Tov on a fabulous job. Wow. Tadabah. Thank you. That, that you summed it up, uh, you know, everything. You summed the movie up. You summed my life up. <laughs> I think I can just get up and leave. I told you I'm not letting you leave this table. Some people wow. I allow leave. You may never leave. I am so thrilled to see you again, to have you here. Finally. Thank Finally, you. Yes. On, camera. on camera. We've done it before, but we not have, on but never never in studio. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah. And uh, you're here in New York, you're gonna be premiering the film. You're here to premiere premiere the film at the JCC in Manhattan during the Israeli Film Festival. So right. Mazal Tov to you as well on that. But it's just thrilling. Everything you've done is thrilling. You know, this is also, we're, we're, we're taping this the day before the screening, but it's also, for me, a very historic day because this is the 6th of June. That's right. And on this day, 51 years ago, I went from Beersheba. I was a young s a soldier in the Israeli uh, army, and uh, a friend of mine and I were waiting in Beersheba to join the fighting. I mean, we were, we were entertaining. We were entertainers. But you were in the idea. Yeah. You were and, serving. And we, we were waiting. To, how do we get into the Gaza Strip? How do we move in? And on this day, exactly on the 6th of June, uh, two young soldiers came back from the fighting in Rafia, at the Ra at Rafa, in the Gaza Strip, with a uh, jeep that they had confiscated, a Russian jeep, brand new Russian jeep. And they came to uh, collect some, you know, uh, stuff in Beersheba to take back. And the two of us said, you know, maybe we can join you. They, there's two seats in the back. And they said, yeah, if you want, come on, jump, jump on. And that's how I got uh, across the border into the Gaza Strip. From there on, we went from Rafiach to El Arish, down to the canal, and it was uh, historic, not, not, not just for me, but that's today, and today was also D-Day, 6th of June. So we are sitting at a very Yes, uh, as we tape, time. this is an incredible, yeah. and it's, Bowie, uh, again, the program airs after we tape it, but it's so important to me that we're taping during the Six-Day War. The fact of that did not escape me, because that's really what your, your film relates to that. And I want to talk to you about so many aspects of that film. I'll ask one question, though, out of sequence. Since you were performing, do you remember hearing for the first time, Yerushalayim, Shel Zahav, Jerusalem of Gold? Well, not only do I, hear, I remember hearing it at that time, but uh, in uh, April of 1967, a couple of months before the war, I uh, performed and won the first prize in yes. the Israel Song Festival. Yes. What did you sing? I sang Mi Odea Kama. Okay? It's a beautiful ballad. By the Mi way, this is a fair to you, but so what? A cappella, just a, eight yeah. bars. Mi Odea Kama, Mi Odea Kama, Mi Odea Ech Velama. He won the first prize. Okay? And the song is about? It's about a girl who has lovely... Uh, Nemashim um, freckles and, and curly hair, and, and it was basically very much about my first wife, Zichron Adivracha, who had passed away, and we, we were just had met at that time. But the interesting thing about it was this was in Binyane Homa in Jerusalem. It was the annual song festival. During the intermission, after we all sang the songs, and the audience was about to vote, okay, they were voting during the intermission. Uh, Teddy Kolek, who was the mayor of Jerusalem, had commissioned a song from Nomi Shemer about Jerusalem, yes. that he wanted a new song about Jerusalem. And so during the intermission, while they were counting the votes, a young lady walked on stage. Name her? Named Shuli Shunatan. Natan with a guitar. I get the shivers 
when I'm Absolutely, thinking about it right Mike. now. Shirley walks up, nobody knew who she was, just with a guitar, started strumming, and we were sitting in the dressing rooms waiting for the results of the vote, and over the speakers we hear the first strumming of the introduction of Jerusalem of Gold, and she sang Yerushalayim Shazahav with the old verse which says that we cannot go down to Jericho, we can't go to Har Habayit, okay? The song ended... Har Habayit is the Temple Mount, Temple Mount in Jerusalem. The song ended, there was a hush for about a couple of seconds, the audience broke out in waves of applause, and they wouldn't stop. She had to come back on stage and sing it a second time, okay? That was the first time Jerusalem of Gold was ever performed, despite the fact that my song went on to be the number one hit. What came away from that festival was Jerusalem of Gold. Were you moved by it? Oh, my God, we couldn't believe it. It was like a bird. Her voice was like a bird. And so to move forward to the 6th, uh, actually it was the 7th or the 8th of June, we were in the Gaza Strip, and I was entertaining in the middle of the desert. Every night we would stop. We were about a day behind the fighting, and some jeeps or command cars would put on their lights, and I would stand there and sing and entertain the troops. Roughly how old were you? I was 21. You were a kid. No, sorry, I was 20. I hadn't even... You were a kid. I hadn't I, I reached 21. I was still 20. And all of a sudden, every hour, obviously, we would have these little transistor radios in those days. And everybody, every soldier would have one and listen to the news on the hour. Beep, 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 beep. Kalkol Israel Mirushalayim. This is the voice of Israel broadcasting from Jerusalem. And at that moment, we heard a, broad, a live broadcast from the Kotel, from the wall, Rabbi Gorin arrived with the shofar, blew the shofar, and said, Shechianu vikimanu vigianu lazman azeh. It was a very famous photo of him arriving of at the wall when we liberated the Western Wall. And again, I'm just really, I'm shivering. And everybody, and we heard Jerusalem of Gold. The soldiers at the wall started singing Jerusalem of Gold. We were singing it in the middle of the Gaza Strip. And I'll never forget that moment. And that was on the, thir the second day. That's the 7th of June. The 7th of June. That was the day after. So oh, wait, this it, is a historic time we are living through. It, it, brings, one, it brings tears to yeah. one's eyes, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. So I have something, you know, very special about Jerusalem of Gold that I carry all these I'm years. glad I asked you. Yeah. By the way, you're born in New York. How do you end up in Israel? My parents, may they rest in peace, Pesach and Lillian, were two of the greatest stars of the Yiddish theater worldwide. And in 1954, we were invited to come and perform Yiddish theater in Israel. We had been, uh, I started when I was seven with them in Argentina, in South America, in Paris. And in 54, we flew to Israel. Actually, we didn't fly. In those days, it was by boat. We went from Marseille. I remember the name of the, the boat was called the Arza. I even remember the name of the captain. His name was Khodorov. What happened yesterday, don't ask me. <laughs> but what happened in 1954, I remember. And we arrived in Haifa, in the port of Haifa, and my parents started crying. They saw the, that golden dome and, and, uh, and all the, the, uh, the, the uh, porters, you know, all the guys that worked at the port knew my father from Poland before the war. And so we came to Israel. We started performing Yiddish theater. But at that time, unfortunately, there was a battle in Israel against the Yiddish language. Uh, it, they wanted to establish, the leaders of the country wanted to establish Hebrew as a national language. And they were afraid that Yiddish might, you know, be too influential. It was the language of the diaspora. And so they fought against us. Uh, it was very difficult for us. For about a year and a half, we performed Yiddish theater, and eventually we had to go back to the States because they didn't want Yiddish at that time in Israel. The authorities who all spoke Yiddish at home. Okay, I mean, but at some point you decided to become, you make Aliyah. In 1962, we came back. And at we, that, the whole family? The whole family. And we, uh, then we came back and performed for uh, two years, almost three years, our Yiddish repertoire until in 1965, 
my luck uh, was that I was cast in an Israeli, the first Israeli musical film in Cinemascope and Technicolor called Shnei Kuni Lemel, The Two Kuni Lemels, based on a Yiddish musical by Abraham Goldfaden. And once I did that film, it was in Hebrew, obviously, uh, the day after that film came out, I, my life changed. Mm -hmm. It was like what happened to Dustin Hoffman <laughs> with The Graduate. The next day, I became a major, major star in Israel. And to this day, since 19, when the film came out in 1966, you ask any Israeli, and they'll tell you, Gadal nu alecha. We grew up on you, and I'm Kuni Lemel. No matter what I've done over these years, we did two sequels, Kuni Lemel in Tel Aviv, Kuni Lemel in Cairo, and I am known as Kuni Lemel. Mm -hmm. yeah. I made reference in the open that when I read about your youth and the way you're, you grew up in a theatrical family, it reminds me of the story of, the, of George M. Cohen yes. and his family. Um, was it hard on you, a seven-year-old, being in theater, and that was your life, and you did not have a typical childhood? Uh, that's true, but uh, as far as I'm concerned, it was not hard, because from the moment I stepped on that stage, actually I was three when I first walked out on stage on Second <laughs> Avenue at the National <laughs> Theater. My father was performing a matinee, and I was three years old, and his buddies... Uh, put a, uh, a top hat and a beard on me, and they said it was a Christmas, uh, a Christmas matinee, and they they said go to Daddy, and I had no, you know, compulsion. I walked right out, and my father was singing, and the audience was laughing, and he stopped singing and he looked at me and he said, "Who are you?" I said, "I'm Santa Claus." <laughs> I was three years old. He Santa Claus, what are you doing here? I said, "I want to sing." He said, you want to sing? What do you want to sing? So I mentioned one of my father's famous recordings, Hotza Mama Pir Batsotza, something or nothing. That. He said, go ahead and sing. I sang, and I bowed, and I ran off the stage. And That's I came back, and I, and I remember that. That was my mm -hmm. So in, when I was seven, uh, I fell in love with it, and I knew this was what I wanted. Uh, okay, now come back to Israel and tell me, you're, you're now a star after this first film. But how does Mike Burston get cast to replace Jim Dale in what at the time was a huge hit on Broadway, yeah. the, the musical Barnum, which Jim Dale had originated the role, and now you replace Jim Dale. How does that happen? That was the craziest thing that ever happened to me. Uh, this was 1978. I uh, was offered a television show in Holland. Yes. Don't ask me. <laughs> things, some things are just shared. Some <laughs> things in my life have happened, uh, and I can't explain them. I was working at an uh, Israeli nightclub in Jaffa, a tourist club, where tourists used to be bussed in, and I would do my show about Israel, you know, uh, for the tourists. And uh, one day, a Dutch journalist, uh, a correspondent that was based in Israel, came to see my show. It was 1978. They were about to s celebrate Israel's 30th uh, anniversary. And she said, I think your show would be great. We're looking for something to do on Dutch television to celebrate Israel's 30th anniversary. Uh, at that time, Israel was, was the uh, favorite, you know, in, in Holland. Uh, I wish we could go back to those days. But uh, she said, uh, can I suggest it to a friend of mine uh, who is Jewish and runs one of, the, uh, one of the stations, one of the companies in Holland? I said, sure. You know, I, I forgot about it. She said, I'll give you his phone number. Call him. I said, yeah, sure. Anyway, I figured, all right, what can I lose a phone call? So I called the guy, very nice guy, and he said, if you're ever on your way uh, to the States or somewhere, stop by in Holland. You know. So I did. I was on my way to the States. I stopped by in Holland. In those days, we had LPs. We didn't have videos even in those days. And I left him a couple of my LPs, and that was it. 
And I, I flew to Los Angeles, and uh, a couple of days later at 6 in the morning, I get a phone call, and I fall out of bed. He said, we'd like you to do a show for our station for Yom Atzmaut. i make a long story short. We, they built an Israeli nightclub for me in a studio in Holland. I did that show. As a result of that special show, they offered me my own television series, variety show. In Holland. In Holland. In Dutch, by In the way. Dutch. <laughs> and they said, oh, you, you can speak English, we'll subtitle it. You know, I said, no, I'm going to learn Dutch. I, I called the Dutch uh, embassy in Tel Aviv. They gave me a, a teacher, and in three months I learned, I learned Dutch. And wow. I went back, and for four years, I had my own television show in Holland. Okay? Variety show. Was it show. a good time? It was fabulous. Okay. I, I didn't live in Holland. I would fly in every month. I flew in from Israel, did the show, uh, and flew back to Tel Aviv. And one of my guests, I used to bring guests from all over the world, was Cheetah Rivera. Ah. Cheetah Rivera was on my show twice. And after we did the show, she said, what are you doing in Holland? You should be back in the States. I said, well, I'd love to, you know, if I can find something to do. Uh, I said, I just, I was in New York. I saw a wonderful show called Barnum. You know, that's something I would dream of doing. She said, well, Cy Coleman is my friend, the composer. She went back, recommended me to Cy Coleman. And when Jim Dale left the show, after a year, they were looking for a replacement. And about 100 stars, you know, wanted that part. Big Everybody Big wanted names. that part. They, they even told me that the $6 million man, <laughs> I forgot his name, he was very popular at that time. He came to audition to replay because it was circus, you know, it was a very... Anyway, I had the chutzpah of flying in from Israel on my own dime and auditioning for the show, and I got the part. What did you sing? I learned the... I, I learned two of the songs from the show. Okay. There's a sucker born every minute. Yes. And the museum song, which got was it. very difficult, and the colors of my life, which is my favorite. What a fabulous and song. believe it or not, they hired, and I was the first, there was a uh, headline in the New York Times, uh, Arts and Leisure section, Israeli to replace Jim Dale in Barnum. And that's what brought him back to the States after many, many years of having been away. By the way, in such an amateurish way, you know I share Barnum with you. I know. I heard it in one of your <laughs> interviews. I think it was with Jake. You were talking with Jake Aaron Raya. Correct. And do you know that Jake actually uh, was a, uh, he played drums. In Barnum? In Barnum. While you were there? While I was there, oh my he was a replacement. He was a, you know, a replacement drummer. And Jake reminded me of this many years later, that he brought his mother to my dressing room. <laughs> and he said, you were so kind to receive her. Uh, and he never forgot that. Well, in but any I case, know, I, I remember. Case, yeah, I was the director of a musical, Barnum in Connecticut, it was the single hardest thing I ever had to do to, I had never been a musical conductor before, I had been involved in, as a musical director, but not as a conductor. And I was, and you know, the nice thing about Barnum is, the musical conductor gets to be on stage oh, sure. for the opening number of the second act. Yes. Come follow the band. That's right. And I get chills. It was one of the most wonderful experiences of my life. But I want you to understand this. I'm thinking then of you because I knew this is what you had done. And in some way, it, in some mystical way, it connected me to you. Had you seen me do Barnum? I hadn't seen you do Barnum, but I met you. I knew the play, and I knew what you had done. I'd seen you in other things. And in some way, the fact that you were the first Israeli on Broadway and you did Barnum, and Mark Golub is now going to be involved in Barnum, and I'm on stage for the, for the second act. Also, I studied with Peter Howard. Well, Peter was the musical. Yes. Was he the, there when you were there? Yes, of course. Peter, Peter Howard, oh, blessed man, memory. Bless, bless his Fabulous soul. human being. He put me into the show. He actually did the audition. He gave me... He taught me the audition when I came to New York. Peter was with me, and then he was my musical director after a while. A very special man. Oh, and by the way, years later, in 1988, 
I did Barnum in Holland. In Holland? They brought the Not production. in Dutch, though. In Dutch. In Dutch. Yes. <laughs> and Queen Beatrice was at the opening night. Uh, and it was at the Carré. The, you know, it's like uh, Carré is like uh, um, Carnegie Hall in the States, in Amsterdam. And we, tra we toured for a year, the same production in Dutch. It was a huge success. Okay. By the way, I, I didn't explain why I've got this beard. Yeah, why do you have the beard, yeah. Mike? Because I'm, I'm shooting another Israeli movie next week in, Lo in Los Angeles, and I have to play a Chabad rabbi. And so <laughs> instead of gluing it, I said, I'm going to do this, and then you can add some more. So Very that's nice. the reason for the beard. And I, did, I played another rabbi last year in a, a new Israeli television series called Judah, which I hope comes here. Uh, it'll probably uh, uh, arrive here on cable. And it's about a Jewish vampire. Uh -huh. a, an amazing series. I think you can pick it up uh, uh, online. But I play a mystical rabbi there. So I've, uh, I've been playing rabbis lately. Okay. It, the time has come. Okay. The other role I just want to mention, and this I did see you, was when you played in Mayor Rothschild, in the Rothschilds. And I saw it off Broadway. What was that like for you? Uh, that and I, you were brilliant. You won a, do, a do, Drama Desk nomination. Right. What was that like for you? Pride. That was the show I would say that I was most proud of uh, because it was about a man who established a dynasty. Yes. And the courage, if you know the history of Meyer, Meyer Amschel Rothschild, and what he did uh, um, to stand as a proud Jew in those days in the ghetto in Frankfurt where they would lock them up every night. And uh, his sons eventually said, you're the richest man in Europe when he was uh, an older man. Isn't it time you left the ghetto? And Rothschild said, I will leave the ghetto when there is no more ghetto. And he didn't live to see it, but his sons eventually broke down both, uh, you know, uh, literally and historically, the walls that were put up against the Jews, and to this day. Uh, so that was one, and it was also the last musical that Sheldon and Jerry wrote Correct. together. The music, I think, is beautiful. I do, too. Some of the, and the final uh, song that uh, Meyer sings, In My Own Lifetime, I think is also a classic, a classic, classic. Um, message uh, that I carry with. The, those are two messages I carry. The other one is carpe diem, seize the day. That's my motto, you know. And that was Myers. So the fa the fact that you know I had played Tevye, uh, which was also by Sheldon Harnick and Jerry Bach, but Tevye was about a poor Jewish milkman who struggled with five daughters. Maya Rothschild was a proud Jew with five sons who had a lot of money. So the, that opposite. And, um, and he had a complicated life still. Yes. Uh, but it, I don't know whether you know, in his will, uh, which is also so beautiful, uh, what he left in his will. In his will, he says, I leave uh, Jacob to, he left each son, I leave Jacob to uh, Anshul, Anshul to this one, uh, and all and the five boys I leave to their mother. Oh. He didn't leave them money. He left each one of them to the other. That's lovely. Yeah, that, that's beautiful. Well, anyway, I hear the last refrain of In My Own Lifetime in your voice as the show ends. It'll, it'll remain with me always. Uh, I've seen you in so many things, and every time I see you, you are absolutely brilliant. Incidentally, you hold dual citizenship. Mm -hmm. How do you self-identify? Do you self-identify more as an Israeli or more as an American? When I'm in Israel, I'm an Israeli. When I'm here, I'm an American. What, what an honest statement. Yeah. That, I don't even have to think about it. Yes. In both places, you're a Jew. Yes, but also, interestingly enough, uh, when I'm in, uh, in Israel, I can also 
kind of put my American side uh, on the side and look at it, uh, see the Israeli side as an American. When I'm here in the States, I can also, as an, sometimes as an Israeli, I look at the Americans and kind of think, wow, what naive people. <laughs> It's, so, it's okay. kind of, I can okay. look you, at it objectively you, you, okay. and subjectively. You open the door, I will walk through. Uh oh. How do, where, what upsets you about the way American Jews tend to look at and discuss Israel? The fact that most of them, the majority, have never, never. visited Israel. Correct. And they're judging it by what they see in the media. How accurate is what they see in the media? Not at all, neither, from neither side of the spectrum. You cannot understand Israel if you haven't landed there physically and experienced it. So that, to me, is amazing. And I don't know what the percentage is, but I understand it's a very small percentage of American Jews about 30 percent have ever visited Israel correct I can't understand that. I can't either and does it make you angry does the criticism you hear coming out of American Jewry as the Israeli of you does it make you angry it makes me sad it makes me very sad because I don't know what what it portends for the future of the relationship between the American Jewish community and Israel. And it is of utmost importance that we don't lose the relationship between us because frankly, Israel today is so strong and so independent and so talented in every way and uh, that we wrote, we, we're not so dependent anymore on what American Jews think. You know, if you ask the average Israeli, they'll tell you machbatli. I don't care what they think. We live here, we live our lives, we don't need, you know, they'll say, we don't need you anymore. Of course, the fact that, you know, over the years, uh, that's not exactly the case, if anybody will be honest, uh, the financial support that we get from the American Jewish community it has been and uh, always was important, despite the fact that today, in, with what we have in high-tech industry in, in, in Israel, I mean, one of our companies was just sold uh, for, I believe to Intel, for $13 billion. And wherever you go in the world, if you want to drive somewhere or go anywhere, and you turn on Waze, it's a miracle. It's, it's used, a miracle. It's a miracle. It's used all over the world. So uh, I would encourage uh, those that, uh, especially today with the h horrific BDS movement that's going on and, and what happens, uh, what, what you see today on the campuses, the influence and the propaganda that is going on, uh, I would really urge uh, before anybody judges what's going on in Israel, get on a plane and spend a week. You will, and then go back and say, then you have the right to say, you know, give your opinion. But you can't give your opinion if you have never seen the reality on the ground. I mean, you know, when you arrive in Israel today, uh, it's, first of all, it's the safest place in the world when everybody, he, you go to Tel Aviv at 2 o'clock in the morning and you'll see young ladies, you know, riding home on a bicycle all by themselves and people say, wait a minute, it's dangerous. Of course it's dangerous if you're going to look for the danger, if you're going to go into the danger zones. But we, uh, you know, in Israel, we have only ourselves to rely on. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget, uh, in 1988, I was in the first March of the Living. I took part in the first March. 1988. It was uh, still communist Poland and uh, we went there to also commemorate the 30th anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. How, did, all you, how did you end up there? Avram Hirschenson, who was at the time uh, organizing it, invited me. He said, we're, we're organizing something special. We want to bring youth from all over the world 
to visit two stops in their lives. First stop, Poland, Auschwitz. Second stop, Israel. Then you can understand what, why Israel is important to you. Those are the two stops. And so they organized the first one. Uh, um, Yitzhak Navon was president. He came. Uh, Rabbi Lau, the great Rabbi Lau was there. Uh, I was there. We had a, a group of uh, artists that came. We also broadcast uh, the, the, uh, f the final of the Chidona Tanakh, the Tanakh uh, quiz from Warsaw, live broadcast to Israel on Yom HaShoah, on Holocaust Memorial Day. And I was the uh, MC for that. And uh, that was in 1988. And I remember uh, we were at Birkenau, and it was snowing. And Bibi uh, flew in. Uh, at the time, I believe he was either uh, ambassador at the United Nations still or deputy foreign minister. And he flew in, and he spoke. And what I remember from his speech, and no matter what uh, politically uh, you are, uh, your thoughts are, but he said something that's always remained with me. And he said, we are speaking from this place here, Birkenau, where it all happened. And there is a message that comes from this space, that a defenseless Jew is a dead Jew, period. That's what we have to take away from here. And that I will always remember. And that's, I believe, the way uh, most Israelis feel today, especially what we're going through and the unfair treatment that we're getting, uh, that uh, we have to defend ourselves. Mm -hmm. We have nobody else to rely on. And no matter what they say about us, we have to continue. Continue. That's our goal, is continue the Zionistic experience. Because I am a Zionist. And we've kind of lost that a little bit. You know, I have to admit, even in Israel, you ask some high school students who Herzl was, and they'll tell you he's the guy, the street in Tel Aviv, you know, Herzl Street. It's sad, but because we've become, you know, we've always wanted to become a country like every other country. And that's true, but we can't because we are the homeland of the Jewish people. There's only one Jewish state. There are hundreds of Muslim countries or Christian countries, but there's only one Jewish country, and it's the state of Israel. And uh, that's what we have to protect. But it's a, it's, it's a matter of believing in Zionism. That's what it's all about, the return to Zion. I'm not saying you have to you know, exaggerate one way or the other. You know, fanaticism is no good in either direction. But that's our home. We have no other home. That's wonderfully said. So I want to talk about the movie. Yes, please. Azimuth. I had to look up the word azimuth. Do you know what it means? You know where it comes from? I want to know how you chose the name azimuth. The az azimuth is an Arabic word. I did not know that. Look at what Wikipedia. Yes. It stems from the Arabic azimuth. It is a directional point on a map. Yes. It's where two directions meet on the horizon. And it's really a metaphor for these uh -huh. two men. Aha. Uh -huh. Who did the story? Uh, that's a, that's an, a story in itself. Uh, he was my lawyer, and he gave me a few pages after the war, about a year later. And he said, this is a story I have, and I think this would make a great movie someday. And he said, here, take it. So he I, gives it to you like in the 60s? In 1968. And you just keep it till then? Yes, 50 years ago. Because I never, I never thought, you know, I wasn't ready to direct a movie. I was, you know, involved in my career. Of course. And I always knew I had it in my draw, and I always used to look back at it, and I said, yes, someday this should be a movie. But that was not my priority at the time. Uh, two years ago, or a year and a half ago, I realized, hey, we're coming up to the 50th commemoration of the Six-Day War. Timing. This is the time to Brilliant. do it. Brilliant. I took it out. I looked at it again. And I said, this, I've always loved the story. I love I the story. I always loved it I love because there's a very special meaning to it. 
And so I took it out, and I tried to get a screenwriter to write an adaptation. But it was so expensive. Anybody that wants, any professional screenwriter, it's not anything I could afford. So yes, I said, you know, I said, I've done things like this before. I bought the program. There is a program that screenwriters use, uh, and it's called Front Page. And you just, it's a uh, um, computer yes. program. And I decided, let me try my hand at doing it again, at myself. And I did. And it took me six months. No kidding. Yes. It took me six months. By the way, it's not a secret. Your wife is with us right now. She certainly is. You're gorgeous. <laughs> Do you remember when he decided he was going to use a program to write Azimuth? Okay. And did you have faith that he could do it? She says, you never cease to amaze her. Um, well, I think I, the script is brilliant. I wrote the script, and I have a friend, a neighbor of mine, who is a sc professional screenwriter. I gave it to her. She looked at it, and with a few comments, she said, you have a script. I said, okay. Then my next challenge was, how do I get this produced? And uh, I was very fortunate. I have two very close friends in Israel. Uh, one is Udi Rekanati, uh, of the Rekanati family, the banking family. We've known each other for many years. I showed it to him, and he said, Mike, we need to do this. I believe in this story. And the other is Moshe Edri, who uh, the Edri brothers run uh, United King Films. And without them, you cannot produce a film in Israel. They've produced all of the major films. They came on board. Hard, hard or easy? Uh, the first one was easy, the second one was hard. It's always the, the last money is the hardest. But we, we put together a very tight budget. Believe it or not, we did this movie for under a million dollars. Unbelievable. Under a million. We it is a feature film. It's like the, the cinematography yes. is out well, of this world. That is. Am I right? Yes. And the score is wonderful. Uh, well. First of all, the, uh, the trick was, I said, if I'm going to direct this, and I wanted to direct it, uh, I said, I need two things, a cinematographer and an editor. And that is the key to any director. And casting. It's all about casting, if you cast it correctly. And I was lucky that I found uh, Ram Shweki, who is a brilliant young cinematographer. I, I consider him a painter. He paints with his camera. And in, in our day and age, we have digital cameras, which we didn't have when I started in the movies. So the possibilities are endless with these cameras. And my longtime editor, Alan Yakubovich, who edited three of my Israeli films, and I said, if you're on board, then I've got the security that I need. You've got real pros around That's you. That's what I need. And so I can do my job, and then I can sit back and but not this interfere. But this was a first-time director? Yes, yeah. Was it fun? It was fabulous. Was it hard? No. Isn't that lovely? No, no beca but, because uh, I, had, I could rely on these two people. It was all we prepared it all. And I've been behind the camera in every film I've done. I mean, okay. I was always involved. So it's not exactly you know. the first time you, were, you did something like this. No, but it's the first time that it was all on my shoulders. Yes, your yeah. responsibility. Uh, my responsibility. Okay. And the key was I wanted this to be as authentic as possible. So I knew I wanted Iftah Klein as the Israeli actor. But I said, I want an Egyptian actor. I That's was Sammy. offered Sammy Sheikh. I was offered. Israeli Arab actors who could have done it. I was offered a Jordanian young man. But l my luck, again, it was Bashert that I was recommended to Sammy. And Sammy is an Egyptian-American actor. He's fabulous. He is not oh, only fabulous. Oh, Yiftach and Sammy. Yeah. Out of this world. Yeah. You couldn't have cast them better. They, uh, the chemistry, and by the way, they don't really meet physically until the end of the movie. The last but, moment of the movie. Yeah. By the way, they both are sympathetic. That was my goal. I know. That was my goal. This and is, you know, somebody uh, wrote about the movie that it's, a, uh, it's an anti-war war movie, <laughs> if there can be such a thing. It, it, it w it's, it's the human aspect of what 
uh, soldiers go through in war. Uh, and uh, my, you know, that, that was the, the story right, was I want to set the story up a little bit more. And you'll tell me how far I can or cannot go. Okay. Because it ultimately is what happens once the situation is established. But ultimately, you have two soldiers. I already said one is an Egyptian, one is a, an Israeli. The movie also has flashbacks mm -hmm. where we get to understand who they are. The suggestion is, you tell me if I have it right or not, it's clear the Israeli soldier who's celebrating a Brit Milah is called up during the Six-Day War. The Meluim for his... Correct. The Egyptian soldier, we also meet, there's a lot of parallel in this movie. Mm -hmm. So the Egyptian soldier we meet, his wife as well, we meet both wives. There's reference to their families even a generation earlier. And by the way, that was not in the original story. Who added that? I, I added all the flashbacks. Mitsuya. Yeah. Mitsuya. Fabulous. What, that was genius of you. Okay. And you understand without that, by the way, the film isn't the same film. Sure. I don't know what the story was, but it's because of their past mm -hmm. that it has the power when, we, when they ultimately are confronting each other. And the Egyptian soldier, and they, you know, the Egyptian soldier, his wife wants to, there's a question, will it, will it be an olive orchard that they're going to do in, in Egypt? Mm -hmm. Olive, and he wanted something else. I think grapes. Uh... He, but, and he says to his wife, we'll have both. Yeah. And then there's a, a lot to do with the tithe of the land the, for Mati's storyline. Right. And how that comes from his parents who are ultimately in barren land and they're going to make something out of this land. And both wives say to their husbands, I'm afraid you're never going to come back. Mm. The Egyptian is called up and the Israeli is called up. Both wives say, I'm afraid you'll never come back. And there's a scene in the movie where the Israeli buddy is walking along the beach with his arm around his wife. And he's talking about how his parents, and there's flashback, mm -hmm. wanted to create something out of this land. Out of the sand. Out of the sand. By the way, it's a sand dune. Mm -hmm. And now they're walking through the sand. And, his, and, the, and, the, and, and Mori says, the Israeli says to his wife, they want to take all this away. And they want to push all of this into, into the, the sea. Ocean. Into, into the, the sea. sea. Yeah. And... In essence, that's why he's going to have to fight. But his wife still says, I'm worried you're never going to come back. And the Egyptian wife says the same thing to her husband. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid your children are going to grow up without a father. That's right, yeah. And yet they have to go. We don't see the war. It is now the end of the war. And as I said, in some way they're both trying to get home. It doesn't matter how. And they end up coincidentally, for different reasons, in a structure, a building that had been used by the United Nations, which is all Irony of out. irony. Irony, because ultimately <laughs> the entire movie takes place, the confrontation takes place in this building, which was never able to do what it was meant to do. On the contrary, that's what triggered the Six-Day War. Tell us why. When Nasser ordered the United Nations UNEF force that was between Israel, a buffer after 1956 war between Egypt and Israel, he ordered them to leave within 24 hours. And once they left... The and war, they left. They left. Boy, uh, they picked up... Utah, without even consulting the nobody. securities guy, right. nobody he said, yeah, you want us out? Okay. And that and was... And their responsibility was to be a buffer. And what they and what they, they promised, and what they have been do doing ever since, uh, as far as Israel is concerned, and this is an interesting story because the original story had this building, but we didn't know what this building was. In the original story, it was not a United Nations. No, Nation. who did that? Michael Oren, my dear friend. <laughs> okay, listen. Every, how everything just 
this was isn't it came brilliant? together. Isn't it brilliant? I had the story and I had the building and we didn't even have a building until two weeks before we started shooting. We were we were scouting all over the country. We shot the movie in Mitzbeh Ramon uh, that stood in for Sinai and Nebi Musa. But we needed a building and we didn't have a budget to build a two-story building. And until two weeks before, my location guy called me and he said, you won't believe this. You won't believe it. I found the building in the middle of nowhere, in the south, in Mitzbeh Ramon. It was a part of a uh, training for the Israeli uh, Defense Forces. They had built this block, two-story building, for training purposes and abandoned it. And we converted it. I mean, it took a while. But it w that was a miracle in itself. And then I said, you know, uh, it's this building, but what is it doing in the middle of the desert? You know, uh, originally we thought, well, it was the, that some Bedouins lived there or Arabs, and they were kicked out when the war started. But that would not be right. And secondly, where would they be living in the middle of nowhere? So I had this dilemma. What is this building? And I called Michael, Michael Oren, who was a dear friend, uh, and was our ambassador in Washington. And I said, I have this, you know, and he had read the script, I have this dilemma. Wh what, what would a building like this be doing in the middle of the desert? He said, make it a United Nations outpost. Brilliant. Just like that. I said, oh <laughs> my God. How perfect, right? Uh, oh, that was it. Yes. And my art department converted it into a United Nations okay. outpost. By the way, Michael Oren's original name, before he made Aliyah to Israel, you know what it is? Michael Burstein. His family name is Burstein, just like mine. And when he came to Israel as a 16-year-old and went to a kibbutz, he was mocked and made fun of because they thought he was Kuni Lemel. They said, Mike Burstein? And they were f making fun of him and calling him Kuni Lemel, and he had... He couldn't understand why until later on he found out. And when we first met, he said, because of you, I had trouble when I first moved to Israel. But Michael is brilliant. He's a Chavar Knesset now, a dear friend. Knesset member. Um, I can't give the resolution of the film. People have to see the film. But there's a message that this gentleman who wrote this after the Six-Day War, was he in the Six-Day War? <laughs> He was, but I'll tell you, and I, was, I meant to tell you this, but uh, we and skipped over his name over again? It. His name was Moshe Nachshon, but the, the story that he gave me was written under the name Mem Amiel. And all these years, for 50 years, all I knew that this story was written by the initial M Amiel, A-M-I-E-L. And so before I started production, I said, I have to, because Moshe Nachshon is not alive anymore. I couldn't ask him who this Mem Amiel was. And I said, maybe he's still alive, or maybe he's got kids, or whatever. I need to find out and get the rights to this story from Mem Amiel. I searched high and low for months through the citizenship uh, uh, you know, records in Israel. I asked everybody, Writers Guild, there was no M. Amiel. So I said, okay, I'm going to start the movie. But I have a friend in Israel who's a, an attorney, and I said, did you know Moshe Nachshon, the uh, lawyer? He said, yes, his attorneys. I said, could you check in uh, the attorneys, the, the, uh, um, the legal, what's the, the bar association? Is maybe there's some, you know, uh, uh, files of his or records of someone by the name of M. Amiel that may, oh, he said, I'll check. He comes back to me the next day, the day when we started filming, and he said, are you standing up or are you sitting down? I said, I'm standing right now. He said, well, sit down. Okay, I checked, okay? Mem Amiel was the underground name of Moshe Nachshon in the Etzel. He was the commander at the age of 16 of the Etzel underground in Petah Tikva. That was the Irgun. The Irgun, he was 16. The British arrested him, but released him because of his age. And he became the, et, the uh, Irgun commander in Petah Tikva. And he used the name M. Amiel, was his Irgun uh, underground name. And it, Amiel is the people of God. 
Mem Amiel. And so it came full circle that this friend of mine, this lawyer, had written it himself, but instead of using his name, he used his name of having been a fighter for the liberation of that's a wonderful Israel in 1948. Everything about this movie was hair raising. Yeah, ex exactly. Hair raising. There's a sense of this movie, without giving away the end, that we're all people. And that in some way, to make it through life, we have to do this together in some way. To what extent is that what you were trying to convey in this film? This film is a microcosm of the general conflict that has been going on for 70 years between us and our neighbors. Is there another way other than what's been happening up till now to resolve it? Okay, so I'm thinking to I don't know, maybe there isn't. I'm thinking to myself, this is depicting the struggle between Israel and Egypt. Right. We all know that, is, that there's going to be another war in 73, and then Sadat's going to come to Jerusalem. And now there is, to one degree or another, whether it's cold or lukewarm. There's a lack there, of war. Okay, there, yes. It's not a peace. It's peace, but it's more than 40 years, 41 years. Without war. Without killing. Okay. And, and more than that, Israel doesn't, at the moment, fear something coming from Egypt to destroy them. There are other forces Israel deals with, but by and large, it's not Egypt that Israel is worried about. Fair, fair to say? Yes. Okay. And to that extent, there is certainly coexistence of some non-belligerent, non-warfare, maybe even a cold peace. And that's, each one has its his self-interest. Correct. And I'm saying to myself, the average viewer who comes to see your film is not going to think it's an Egyptian and an Israeli. He's going to think it's a Palestinian and an Israeli. And the question is, are you suggesting in your film that the metaphor is not simply for what was the Israeli-Egyptian conflict. Is it a metaphor for today's Israeli-Palestinian conflict? It's not a metaphor. It's a message that I'm trying to send to our Palestinian neighbors. You're sending it to the Palestinian neighbors? Yes. You hope they get it? I would hope very strongly You're hoping that they see this and understand what was accomplished by nonviolence. What we were able to accomplish, I don't know, maybe I'm saying too much, but what we were able to accomplish with Egypt, and there's been 40 years, that message hopefully should resonate with our neighbors that what they've tried up till now with terrorism and violence has not worked and won't work and maybe if they saw my mute my movie maybe my message will get across to them very interesting i would love this to be seen in egypt we're trying to get the film to be seen because as far as the egyptians are concerned and that's the reason that sammy agreed to do the movie he first sent the script to his father who had fought in the Six-Day War on the Egyptian side. And he said, Dad, I want you to read this. Tell me if you think I should do this. And his father read it, and he came back, and he said, Sammy, that's how it happened. They're not showing anything that was not the truth. Real. Real. We're not showing the barefoot uh, Egyptian uh, uh, in, in rags, uh, trying, without water or food, trying to get back to the Suez Canal. We're showing him as an honorable soldier who had no choice. Yes. And one thing that I didn't say, the only thing that the Sammy asked me to change in the film, he read it, he said, there's one thing I need you to change. If you change it, I'll do it. And it's when they're in bed together, and he says to her, we have to, I have to go again. 
because they took them from, they were in Yemen for a whole year, and he pulled them out of Yemen and sent them the next day right down to Sinai. And in the original text, it said, this time we will destroy them, the Israelis. This time we have the means and we're going to kill them all. And he said, this is a simple peasant. They're mostly, these soldiers were peasants. They weren't the officers. They were living in the Nile Delta. It was very authentic. He wanted everything to be authentic. And they were farmers. He said, this, I can't say that as a human being that I'm going to go out and kill the Jews. Uh, that I can't, I can't say that. That's what I would do. I, you have to change that. It's not coming from me. I said, you know, you're right. And all I did was change one word. Well, actually, a few words. What he now says, they tell us that this time we will destroy them. They tell us that we have the means. So it, just by changing that, he said, that's all I want. So it's not coming from this human being. The, the, and that, that was the truth. Oh, that's a brilliant way of handling this problem because otherwise it, it, it's not true also. You can't take it out. No, I but, couldn't take it out. But you took it out of his mouth. Of his mouth. That's yes. what he, yes. And, just, I, and it just came to me. I said, I'll just change those words. It's not me. That's what they, and that's what they did. They're telling us we have to do this. We have no choice. And he says it as well. They tell us, go here, we go here. They tell us, come here, we go there. It's not up to me. And that, would, that, that said, to him, that said, thank you. Because I wouldn't say that. And an Egyptian farmer wouldn't say that. We were not anti-Semitic. We didn't hate the Jews. We were told what to do. We had no choice. And that's what the movie is about. By the way, as I said before, they're both very sympathetic characters. And, and I, I, by the way, I've been criticized uh, by some say, uh, that just because of that, uh, saying, you know, hey, you're showing the other guy, you know, as he's, he's just like us. He's a human and being. I said, Excuse How dare me. you, huh? <laughs> he is just like us. Yeah, that's the whole point, you know, the, the even-handedness, the balance. Because, you know, when you're out there uh, shooting at each other, you don't get to confront the person that's behind the gun. And that's what this movie does. Okay. And now I want to ask the question again. Does this suggest how you feel what is true about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Do you think the Palestinian is the same as the Israeli? It is such a complicated and uh, it's not... I can't answer that with one, in one sentence. There are so many variables. It's so different than what we had with Egypt. It's so why, different. Why is that? We were dealing with a government, with an established government, and here we are dealing with a, a mixture and a, vari a wide variety of independent and different groups. Yes. Which, you know, American Jews have no understanding of. You know, it's not, it's not there's a no nation. Central, there's no, no central command. Right. In Egypt, no matter what, there was a central command, and we were fighting an army. Two armies were fighting. Here, we are dealing with terrorism that doesn't distinguish between children, women, uh, men, Everything is a target, and uh, that is um, immoral. It is, it is not uh, something that we can even understand uh, because that's not our Jewish tradition, or any, uh, not only Jewish, but, but moral, uh, human, humanistic tradition is to kill innocent people, to get a message across, a political message. It is manipulize, they are manipula manipulating their own people, using them, and trying to show it as victim, being the victims. And people do not realize that. They don't see it.
you mentioned this early in the program, that you are disappointed, and maybe there's even a stronger word, with the way in which the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, especially as it applies to Hamas, is portrayed in the American media on American television and in the front page of major American newspapers and magazines online. What would you want American Jews to understand about the situation the Israeli finds himself in? My experience has been, Mike, that if you ask any Israeli, I mean any Israeli. Now, I don't talk to the, to the far-right lunatics, but to the mainstream Israeli. I have not asked one Israeli yet who hasn't answered it the following way. If, if there were an honest broker on the other side that wanted to live with me in peace, if that ever happened, of course I would be willing to have what's called a two-state solution. I just don't see that happening now. And until I can be sure that I can live in peace alongside this other entity, I'm not willing to give up anything. But I believe that the vast majority of, America, of Israeli Jews believe in concept of sharing the land. And when you see the Israeli electorate shift, and it's moved away from that, it's moved away from Oslo, it's not that they've abandoned it in terms of theory or the ideal. They just don't believe there's anybody on this side who isn't, to one degree or another, in a position of leadership that wants to destroy the state of Israel just as Moti says as he's walking along the beach with his wife. To what extent do you feel I'm, ac I'm describing it accurately? But uh, that's in their charter. Hamas charter. The Hamas charter says their aim is the destruction of the state of Israel, and Jews. which means the inhabitants Correct. of the state of Israel. I still remember the, the 40,000 graves that were being dug in 1967 before the war broke in out. In anticipation. In anticipation of, they said they're going to, you know, Nazar will be in Tel Aviv and we will murder and rape and kill everyone. And that hasn't changed. You asked me how Americans should understand. Yes. I don't think they can. Unless you live on a daily 24-hour basis with the looming threat of extinction, rockets, uh, uh, suicide bombs blowing up on a daily basis, there isn't a family in Israel that hasn't experienced either personally or known someone who has been killed or murdered by terrorism since 1948, since even before 1948. So I don't think the concept is not something that you can try and explain to someone who lives very uh, peacefully. I mean, if rockets were coming in from Ontario or from Tijuana on a daily basis, to Los Angeles and kids would have to run within 15 seconds. You have 15 seconds to run into a miklat, into a shelter, and rockets are falling into kindergartens. And every day, every day, the tension, it's the tension that is so, uh, that, 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 uh, that affects Israelis every day. That's why there's so much tension because it is an existential problem. That's, I don't think an American Jew can, can see, can understand it, because they don't have that danger uh, to, to, to contend with every day. Every day someone is being killed or murdered. Uh, so to try and explain it, uh, and as far as the other uh, question you asked, so far, not only is there no other partner that has uh, that is come forward, we haven't even heard anyone even 
mentioning or saying uh, that voice. That voice isn't there. So what do you do? You commit suicide? Have we not learned anything? Not only from 1939, but have we not learned anything from 1948, 1956, 1973, uh, the, the latest 1982, and everything that goes on on a daily basis. American, uh, Israeli mothers and fathers are always sitting by the phone when their kids go off to fight to war. Will they come back? Every young Israeli has to serve in the army. Not every young Israeli American Jew has to go to the army. So they go to college and it's, an, it's a totally different concept to, be, to conceive of. You can't conceive of it. Again, come to Israel, mm -hmm. visit, go around. You know, everybody will be happy to have you come and see the reality on the ground. And then maybe your eyes will open up and you can, you can, uh, you can understand why uh, Israel is so determined uh, not to listen to all these phony uh, United Nations resolutions. Look at the, la the, the latest one. I mean, 70 rockets fell on South Israel, one of them in a kindergarten, and the Security Council came out with a resolution condemning Israel. I mean, is that even, I mean, it's not even it's worth... Incomprehensible. Oh, it's incomprehensible. It's, it's outrageous, morally outrageous. So, uh, you know, that's been the case all these years, and uh, we will only, as I said, we have to defend ourselves. And again, um, I believe in not washing your dirty laundry in public. So when American Jews criticize the leadership in Israel, uh, that is the elected leadership of the people of Israel. Uh, you can like it or not like it, but you're not, you didn't elect these people, you don't live there, uh, you want to you want to change it? Go ahead, move to Israel and vote. But uh, that is the whether uh, it is right or wrong or left or doesn't matter. The Israeli public democratically elected this government, so I think it is incumbent on American Jews to respect the decision of the Israeli people who live there, who elected this government, and until it's changed. You know, don't go out in public and do damage to the people of Israel. That's what you're doing, basically. You're doing damage uh, and feeding in to all our enemies. We have enough enemies from the outside. We don't need enemies from within. You know, those who criticize Israel the way you're describing justify it by saying they love Israel and they want Israel to be the best it can possibly be, and that maybe if you are there, you are too close, and that there's a perspective from afar that might help, and that if there is criticism from American Jewry, maybe it will both strengthen those in Israel who are also upset with the status quo, and in some way it will it'll move Israel in a better direction. That's what's being said by those who criticize Israel here. But the danger is that they are also empowering the enemies, enemies Absolutely. of Israel. And we don't need that right, right now. Right. You know, and who, and uh, you know, nobody's perfect. I mean, the, the Israel isn't perfect. The leadership isn't perfect. We, you know, and it's the only democracy anywhere in that whole area. And we uh, in Israel criticize ourselves. There's constant criticism. I mean, there's no place on earth where a former prime minister was jailed uh, because of facts that came out and nobody's above the law. But, you know, we, we need 
uh, at least fairness uh, from our fellow, uh, not only fellow Jews, but people, anyone who, who wants to support uh, truth. There is truth. Not everything is fa false, you know, what do they call it? Um, phony uh, yeah, uh, fake, new, fake, fake news. news. There is truth. There is truth in the world. Mm -hmm. And there are lies. Mm -hmm. And in, in Israel, ultimately, people will, you know, if something happens, nothing is perfect, we will try and correct it. But the, the most important thing is the survival mm -hmm. of the Jewish state of Israel. And anyone who works to the detriment of that survival is not fair. At least be fair, you know, and f try and find the facts and the truth. Don't listen to propaganda that is solely meant to accomplish that, you know. Uh, the pictures that are shown, the videos that are shown, you know, when you f ultimately people find out that was all staged, you know. Their worst enemy are their leaders. We left Gaza. Completely. We're not there anymore. They could have turned it into a paradise. What they did was they ensla they're enslaving their own people. It's not our fault. We're not there anymore. We understand what you've just said. And yet, your movie is a prayer that war should be no more. That what you really hope is that there will be peace between Israel and every one of its neighbors. Isn't that also part of the message of your movie? You just encapsulated with one word, and I say that when I'm asked what is the movie about, and without giving away uh, right. anything, it's about tikva. Hope. Hope. What, what breaks me up every time is the scene when uh, Yiftach, the Israeli soldier, is coming after the, he's called up, and they're walking out of the house. She's holding the baby in yes. her arms, and he's got to leave her. And they hold, and they, they embrace, and they don't say anything. And she's just crying, and he says, take care of him. And then uh, eventually she says to him, come back. Just those words. And for me, that is every Israeli woman or mother or sister was ever sent a soldier, they can identify with that. Just that, that they're li they don't know whether he's going to come back. That, and, and it's a scene that every Israeli wife has gone through that sends her, her, her husband off to Miluim or to war. That, to me, is the most touching moment. And the same thing with the, with the Egyptian. When they're walking there, the two of them, my movie is about hope. I get chills. Okay, so do you remember the words to the refrain of the closing song under the credits? Ani maftiach lach? Yes. Yes, I remember the song. English? Song English, in English. Or, yeah. In, it's, well, I heard it in English. Okay. I swear, my little girl. I swear? I swear to you once more. I swear that this will be the last of all the wars. I swear, I swear to thee. I swear on all that's free. I swear... This war will be the last you'll ever see. It makes me cry. Yeah, me too. <laughs> it makes me cry. Yeah, me too. It's, you know? So I'm thinking to myself, gee, the movie's about two guys, and yet the song's to a little girl. Now, I think I know why. I want to know if you know why. Well, I swear, my little girl, I swear, I swear to, to you, you once, once more. more. I swear that this, this will be the last of all the wars. I swear, I swear to thee. I swear on all that's free. I swear this war will be the last you'll ever see. Why to the daughter and not to the son? I know why. I want to know if you know why. The song was written originally in Hebrew, obviously, by Chaim Hefer and Dubi Zeltzer. And the original is, Ani maftiach lach, yalda sheliktana. Yalda. Yalda sheliktana, shezot 
תהיה המלחמה okay. האחרונה. Okay. You think it was yelled out only because it fit the cadence? I don't know. I know. I'm going to tell you. Please. Lest anyone ever ask you. Okay. Why does the song pray, promise the daughter that there won't be another war? Not the son. Because both of the sons are begged by the wife, the mother. Don't go. I'm worried you won't come back. And your children won't have a father. Your movie is a promise to every mother, to every wife. One day, she won't have to beg her husband not to go to war. There won't be a war. Her children will be safe. Her husband will be safe. And she will be safe. I accept. <laughs> you know, you know, you know, there are a lot of good things that have happened to me because of the work I've been doing with first L'Chaim and then with now JBS. One of the best things that ever had to me, happened to me was that you came into my life. Okay. And you and I have been friends now for a long time. We may not see each other very often. Matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't yeah. matter. It doesn't matter. Whenever we see each other, it's yeah. like it was yesterday. Yeah. yeah. I treasure you. I want Thank you to know you. I treasure you. Thank you. And your wife, Siona, has been wonderful to me, and she's a treasure to you and in a small way to me. But I want you to know you have been a treasure to me. Thank you. I love you so much. I am so lucky to have you in my life. I can call you anytime I need you, that you call me. Yeah, but you, know, don't, you never answer your phone. <laughs> I, get your, I get your message. I don't need that to be said on TV. <laughs> and it's not true. Uh, you do. Ultimately, not, you do. And yes. I always call you back. That's true. Yeah. Okay, and I always email. That's true. Very often, you call me. I'm in somewhere I can't answer. No, I gather but that's But I always, I, <laughs> you, no, I argue. always, I will. It's, no, it's mutual. You no, know I just want you to know. Thank you. And you have done, you know. I have thrilled to you. I have, in addition to my love of Jewish and TV, I have a passion for theater, whether I've been I know on that. stage oh, yeah. and producing you produced, Broadway. Yeah. Yes. And so for me, my first connection to you was as Mike Burston, the fabulous entertainer, both in English and in Yiddish. On every stage you touch, you have... The Russian, the Russian kid. You yeah. have it, baby. And <laughs> so for you. me to be your friend, Thank what you. a kick for me. And again, you are one of the loveliest souls in the entertainment world. You are the one. So for me, it was, it was just what a gift you were. Then you make this film. And I'm worried. You should know I'm worried. I don't want my friend to make a film I don't like. I adore this film. My wife raves, uh, Ruth raves about this film. We must find a distributor. This film should be in every theatrical house, and it should be on Netflix, it should be on Amazon, it should be on, everybody should see it. From your mouth to God's call, ears. Call Tuva Hatzlacha, Yasha Koach, Mazal Tov. And you know, you're always welcome. I want, you know, your name should be on this chair. You should sit with me and talk to me anytime you possibly can. Uh, I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. And, That's and, so kind. And, Thank and you. And the fact that you enjoy JBS oh, we, means the world to we me. We watch JBS in Los Angeles day and night. My wife turns it on. Uh, m once in a while, we'll go to uh, <laughs> maybe made to Wolf Blitzer for about 20 minutes. And then it's back to Rabbi Gala because it is so, so the programs you not just your program, but yes. all the programs yes. that you show they're so, you know, informative and and educational and entertaining. Anyway, That's what it's all about. I love you and thank, thank you. you, thank you, and Mark. well done, Mike. Thank well you. done, thank beautifully you. done. Thank you. There you have it, Mike Burston. First, one of the finest entertainers in the world, and now his first foray into the world of feature film, writer, director, co-producer of a 
fabulous film. I unreservedly recommend it to every single one of you, Asimov. As always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have. To any of the ideas expressed here by Mike Burston or by me, please email me, write me, post on our Facebook page, or tweet me. I look forward to hearing from many of you. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'chaim, my friends, to life. Education in media.